Welcome everyone, we will be starting in just a few minutes. We'd like to welcome you to today's webinar with Nationwide and the United States Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. It is my pleasure to introduce our president and CEO, Ramiro E. Cavazos. Thank you, Brianna, and thank you for all of your uh, work in uh, helping promote our uh, workshop today here with uh, Nationwide and this wonderful topic, which is only uh, wonderful if you're prepared and can mitigate any risk. So we're very excited to be with Catherine today and, and of course Abhe with Nationwide. But I want to welcome everyone on behalf of the United States Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. Thank you for joining us today to discuss this important issue. Uh, we chose this topic uh, because of the, the many threats, uh, cyber hacks that are out there and they're at an all-time high affecting small businesses right now, especially in light of the challenges that small businesses have been going through. And We've also seen that many of our minority owned businesses who have limited resources and information that this topic is especially for them because many of them unfortunately are being targeted right now. And we wanna make sure that you're prepared and safe. And, and I wanna thank Nationwide and, and uh, their hardworking team for planning today's training uh, program. Uh, I'm very excited to uh, have the pleasure at this time to introduce a, a longtime champion and a longtime friend, uh, not just for myself, uh, but for our small Latino and Latina owned businesses. Uh, she's with uh, Nationwide and has been for more than 20 years. Uh, Lori uh, uh, Burgos is the Multicultural Marketing Director for Nationwide. And she has been a, a tremendous leader uh, throughout the whole country in many communities. Uh, as I said earlier, she's been with Nationwide more than 20 years. But uh, for us and for you, you will see that she has a proven track record of executing and developing culturally relevant programs. And, and that's very important uh, to make sure that there's authenticity in everything that we do. And, and that's what Nationwide represents. So throughout this country, we are very thankful for her longstanding partnership, not just with the United States Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, representing our 250 Hispanic chambers, 5 million, Hispanic, Hispanic owned businesses, 61 million Americans, one out of every six people and a tremendous economic impact. So this topic of cyber threats is very important. I wanna thank Lori because everything that she does is authentic and, and meaningful. And so this is a timely uh, topic and we will learn today from the best, from of course Abhe and from Catherine. And so uh, we want you to stay ahead of the curve. And so today, I'm very pleased to introduce Lori Burgos, and I turn it over to her. Lori, muchísimas gracias. Thank you very much at Nationwide. Gracias, Ramiro. We are so super excited about today. Um, I am not going to introduce myself because you already did. Thank you so much for your kind words. It's been really um, a true honor to work with your team for the last few years. And we are just really delighted to, uh, to be partnering with you guys today to deliver this virtual workshop, like you said, in such an important topic, especially for small businesses that are definitely being targeted and, and for our Hispanic business owners. So 
Um, as you know, this webinar is an extension of the Business Solution Series, which was an online business builder program that we worked with your team and we launched earlier this year. As, I, as a matter of fact, uh, some of the experts that helped us launch that program might be on the line, um, Carlos Hill and Nick uh, Delgado. And so our intention when we built this program was really to provide an on-demand access to experts and tools so that our Hispanic small business owners could grow and run, um, could run and grow their business. And so for those of you who are on the line and have not had the opportunity to um, access the program or to view the program, you can access it through the USHCC website. And so at Nationwide, we are really committed to doing our part to help support you, Hispanic business owners around the US, especially during these challenging times. Um, we know that COVID-19 has really changed the world and how we do business. It has accelerated the need for digital transformations across all sizes of businesses. And with the move to the digital world comes the exposure to cyber threats. And so I was doing research in, in, as, I, as we were preparing for today and Nationwide conducted a, a business owner survey earlier this year. And one of the findings was really surprising to me. Uh, of the, the respondents, 65% of small business owners had been a victim of a cyber attack, yet only 4% had implemented all of the cybersecurity best practices and recommendations from the SBA. Um, and so today we really want to do our part in helping changing those statistics. So today's speakers are Catherine Rudo, Vice President, Cyber Insurance at Nationwide, Anna Pei Yoshi, IT Risk Management Professional, also at Nationwide. As the Vice President of Cyber Insurance at Nationwide, Catherine Rudo is responsible for developing and expanding the cyber insurance product expertise across the company. She is an expert in cyber insurance risk and speaks frequently at national and international conferences on a broad range of cyber topics. Abe Yoshi is a certified information systems security professional and has more than 20 years of IT experience, including consulting on numerous cybersecurity and IT risk management initiatives. So with that, please join me in welcoming Catherine and Abe. Thank you, Lori. And I'm going to get started shortly here. Share my screen. All right. We're good, Brianna? Yes. Perfect. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you for joining us this afternoon. We hope that you know, by the end of this presentation, you will have a better understanding of some of the exposures as well as maybe a couple of helpful hints that you can take home to protect your businesses better. So without further ado, we're going to start it off, make every, get everybody on their toes here with a poll question. So most small companies are too small to be targeted by cyber criminals. Everybody is welcome to vote at the poll on your screen or on your phone. We'll give you a few seconds. Okay. Look at that. That's great. <laughs> it doesn't, so uh, we have a very educated audience here, but um, that doesn't seem to be the general consensus in the market. We, what we find uh, in studies is that a lot of companies think that they are too small to be targets and don't even have you know, a dedicated employee or vendor for cybersecurity. But the problem with that thinking is that the criminals don't really have to know about you to find you. The process of finding companies with vulnerabilities is often automated. So even if you are not, even if you think you are too small, you are definitely still on the radar if you have any outward facing vulnerabilities. And in fact, I think that small businesses make very tempting targets. One of the main reasons is that there are millions of small businesses in the United States, and that just makes for a big pool of targets and therefore attractive to criminals. Furthermore, if you look at small businesses, they tend to have less sophisticated systems, uh, less training, monitoring, patching. Uh, there's generally speaking uh, 
a smaller investment in resources into cybersecurity, which really just makes them into softer targets. So while the techniques and tactics and efforts made by the criminals for small businesses might differ from those of large, that when they attack large businesses, the truth is uh, many criminal organizations specialize in targeting small businesses. You know, cybercrime is becoming more organized and more specialized. Now, what is the exposure for small businesses? Well, everybody seems to agree, uh, and we saw in your survey, so do you, that the digital risk is growing. And they're right. Um, by all measures, the attacks against smaller businesses are rising, and it is resulting in significant claims activity for this segment. I come from the insurance side, so um, this is where we see it. And despite, despite everybody understanding that the small businesses are still exposed, a recent report still finds that seven out of 10 businesses are unprepared for a cyber attack. And what we're hoping is after this webinar, you're gonna have a better understanding of how you can prepare for and manage, uh, mitigate a cyber attack. So why would a small business invest the time into um, uh, their cybersecurity program? I mean, at the end of the day, cybersecurity attacks can be extremely costly for businesses and it can take a lot of time. It can damage a company's reputation, and that can also make it even harder to recover from a loss. So no matter what kind of attack uh, a company suffers, and we're gonna go through a few different types in a moment, um, there are often costs like forensics, where uh, that helps find the problem and stop the problem. You know, if there's a data breach, there'll be customer notification. And you know, often when you have a cyber attack, it causes your systems to come down, your business has to stop functioning and that can result in a business interruption loss. So how do attackers gain access? Well, I think everyone in this call has probably heard of phishing at this point, um, but even though everybody's heard of phishing, you know, this is still a very successful attack vector for criminals to get into your systems. Uh, but it's not the only way, there's also a growing way is the remote desktop protocol. And I think put simply is that's a protocol that was developed by Microsoft that allows a remote user to connect to another user. Uh, most people will understand this is when you allow your system administrator to help you troubleshoot or do software installations for you, like when they take control of, or you can watch them taking control of your computer screen. Um, but using strong password protocols, keeping your remote desktop protocol updated and patched, uh, putting it behind your virtual private network, we call it VPN, these are all good ways to secure your remote desk protocol. And Abe is going to go into a whole bunch of um, tips to, to help with this as well. Another way that criminals get into your system is through the use of compromised passwords. The reuse of passwords really does make it easy for criminals to gain access to a computer system and can even do so as an employee. So they can practically pose as a legitimate user since they have the correct username and password combination or they can figure out the correct username and password combination. There are other ways you can um, go visit infected websites, drive by, download of malware, uh, that is a problem for right now, especially with COVID as people are looking for more information, they're curious, they're searching on, um, they're searching on the internet. And there was a significant increase in registered websites that were, you know, intended primarily to scam that were COVID related. So be careful when you start looking for information regarding COVID and the pandemic. And last thing is managed service providers. This is, you know, if your IT gets infected, could you get infected or a third party? Yes. Um, but generally speaking, uh, these are savvier companies and generally safer. So, uh, and Abe is going to give you some tips on assessing those vendors shortly. So what are some of the main cyber losses uh, for small businesses? Well, there's ransomware, uh, which is the biggest problem we're seeing right now. Um, the, well, the most well-known type of loss, the most common People, the most common loss that drives the purchase of, say, an insurance product is the data breach loss. Those are always well publicized. Um, there's business interruption from a cyber event. It doesn't just have to be from ransomware or data breach, but anything that can bring your systems down. There's always reputational damage. And um, the last thing that we're going to cover is this business email compromise, so payment instruction fraud. And it's included in this presentation. 
it's not so much a hack, but because it's becoming a big problem for small business, it's often lumped in as a cyber loss, but it's really much more of a con game where users are tricked into sending money to a fraudulent account. So we'll go into that a little bit more in a few slides. So the first thing is we're gonna tackle is ransomware. Ransomware is big news in my world, but in case you haven't had the pleasure of following the success of these criminals in the ransomware world, let me just say that they have found an easy way to victimize any type of organization, any size of organization with ransomware. Essentially, once ransomware gets onto a system, uh, with one of those ways that were explained before through phishing or the remote desk protocol, remote desktop protocol, excuse me, the malware will encrypt all the files it comes across. And the only way to unencrypt them is to pay the ransom for the encryption key. Now this takes time, whether you pay or not, or, or you go back to your backups to, to bring your information back up, it's gonna take time. And during that time, your system are, is down. Your company cannot function. Um, so, you know, you, you end up with a business interruption loss on top of all the other losses that you have to pay in terms of uh, um, ransom and forensics and so forth. It has caused a lot of damage and they predict about $11 billion worth of total damage in two, 2019 from ransomware. It is a growing problem and it's only growing bigger. The ransomware trends, because ransomware um, has been so lucrative, the organized crime component of it has increased in complexity and sophistication. So the attacks not only are increasing in number, but they are getting increasingly complex, which is also making them a little longer to resolve. We are seeing ransomware sometimes combined with a data breach, which is when uh, criminals will go into your system, they'll stay on there for a little while, pull out data, and then when they're done doing pulling exfiltrating your data, they'll release the ransomware malware. And so now what they can do is they can double dip, right? They can say you can get the encryption key and you pay for that and you also have to pay us so that we don't publish your data. So um, it gives them a little bit more leverage in negotiations. That is less of a problem for small businesses. Uh, what is a bigger problem for small businesses is that the ransomware payments are going up. Um, we are seeing ransomware payments that a few short years ago, maybe have been in a few hundred dollars, are now averaging over $100,000. So there's some significant rises in the ransomware payments. So data breach, I think this is uh, probably most people on this uh, webinar will, will have understood this. It has been, it's always in the news, whether it's Target or Home Depot or the Anthem breach you know this is this is always going to be a problem the criminals in this case they make money by selling the data that they exfiltrate from companies um, it's always going to be there it's not it's not where they're it's not where the criminals are focusing their attentions right now but um, there are a lot of costs involved with a data breach uh, largely because information is regulated so if you hold any personal information or healthcare information or financial information, you're usually subject to federal or state laws. If you take payments, you're subject to payment card industry and all of these regulatory bodies can also assess fines. So we also have business interruption. You know, we discussed earlier with ransomware, your systems are down while they're being encrypted or what about a denial of service attack? which is when your website gets overwhelmed with traffic and on purpose. So people are sending all this, streaming all this, this, um, this information to your website and it's causing it to crash. Um, the other thing, you can also have a business interruption which is not related to a hack. It can be your own IT department um, makes a mistake or there's a glitch, bring down your systems. And the last, the last source of a business interruption can be, if, you're, if, you do, if you rely on a third party, for example, an internet service provider and they go down, your systems will go down too. And as long as they're down, uh, you, you really have less options. You know, I would also add that in the time of COVID where people are working from home, this is probably a little exacerbated too because a lot of companies in the past, if, they're, if they have their business interrupted, but they're all located, all the employees are located in the same place, they can sort of pull out pen and paper and 
figure out how to continue to conduct business. But if you have all your employees spread out in their home and there's no way of contacting them, you know, your business interruption loss could be exacerbated. All right, we're gonna come back to that uh, business email compromise. Uh, this I mentioned earlier because it's often lumped in with uh, cyber losses, but really what it is, you can sum it up as it's a scam. You know, criminals are using, they're very using very sophisticated techniques, fool employees into wiring money into their account. However they accomplish that, uh, there are a number of ways, but they can victimize some of the most sophisticated businesses. It can be done by sending bogus invoices, you know, attackers can pose as an executive or as not impersonating someone else in a company, or they can, um, um, they can compromise a, a business account so it looks like it's coming from a legitimate user when in fact it is not. So the best defense for businesses here are its employees. Um, you are, go here, you're going to hear it throughout this presentation how important it is uh, to train your employees, not just for business email compromise, but just general awareness, cybersecurity awareness. In this case, it's a scam. So what you really want is your employees to be aware that people are trying to scam them all the time. So what can we do for that? We can use two-factor authentication, verify requests, especially when there's a change um, in account information like wire uh, instruction, uh, wire instruction changes. So how you pick up the phone, call, make the phone calls, um, put processes and procedures in place so that there is a way to authenticate payments, especially large payments before they go out the door. And the FBI has um, a, a repository where you can um, report your claims. For example, uh, I've put it down here on the bottom of the screen. You can see it there. Um, they track these claims. Um, I think I have a number here. Did I not put it up? Oh, I'm sorry. Let me just see if I have the... There we go. The email compromise, you know, they, they have it at 1.7 billion, but that's only what's been reported into them. A lot of companies don't necessarily report into the FBI. All right, here we go. Poll question number two. What challenges keep your IT security posture from being fully effective? Please vote on your screen. I'll give it a few more seconds. I see a few people still voting. All right, that's very interesting. On the next slide, what I'm gonna show you is this exact same question was done in a survey. And uh, the top, we, we, actually, we actually put these in the, in the order in which the uh, answers were on the survey. You'll see it in a moment, but it's interesting. So Abe and I can't help you on the top two, which is insufficient personnel or insufficient money but no understanding on how to protect against cyber attacks is what we're here to help you with. And with that, I am going to turn this over with, to Abey. Thanks, Catherine. Can you all hear me? Yes. Okay. So we're gonna focus on providing some tips on these areas around employee training, awareness, endpoint security, network security, identity and access management, which is becoming a bigger deal these days. Email security, because as we learned so far, it is a pretty significant threat vector. Scanning and patching, backup and recovery planning, incident response plan, managed security services, and cyber risk insurance. So let's go to the next slide. So employee training. Um, so for an effective cybersecurity, uh, uh, you know, uh, program, you want to have a combination of people, process, and technology. So you can deploy all sorts of fancy tooling and toolkits and tool sets, but if you don't have the people and processes that can take advantage of that tool sets and 
uh, work with what the tools are telling you, you're setting up yourself for failure. One of the biggest components is um, from an employee awareness perspective, uh, you want to make sure that you know you're sharing what is your organization's inf information security policy. Do you expect uh, employees to be working on their own devices, or you only expect them to work on uh, your you know business provided uh, laptops or desktops or whatever the case may be? So setting that context up front is important. It also reminds them about what are safe behaviors, what are the right uh, right things to look at in case of any issues or things like that, if they um, see or if they suspect that they have received a phishing email and they have clicked on it, do they know what to do? Do they know who to go to and report it so that further review can be done? So you want to uh, do these training programs on an ongoing basis, at least a couple of times a year. You also, you also want to focus on safe email, internet and social media practices. Different organizations and uh, companies have different policies, whether it's acceptable to visit social media sites and whether it's blocked, right? So those are things to consider. Uh, doing the internal phishing test just to keep the employees on the toes and getting them become more uh, comfortable with identifying what is a phishing email. Uh, they're getting very sophisticated and very customized, so recognizing what is a phishing email is going to be an important aspect to consider for your small business. Uh, again, from a human resource policy perspective, you definitely want to do background checks on all the employees that are joining your organization. At a minimum, you want to do background checks on people who are going to be handling sensitive data like processing payments, installing software on your laptops and PCs and things like that. Incorporating uh, training as part of your onboarding is a very effective tool because it kind of uh, sets the stage right at the very beginning. And more importantly, if an employee leaves your company or organization, take away their access immediately to prevent um, access just lingering on after they're no longer part of your organization. Next please. So next we're gonna to go to endpoint security. Uh, so your question may be, what is an endpoint? Essentially, any device that's connecting to your network is an endpoint. So think of laptop, desktop, servers. Uh, these days, there's a lot of these Internet of Things devices. So all of those are endpoints as well. Uh, one of the biggest things is enforcing passwords on all of those devices. The last thing you want is a device that goes missing and there's no protection because anybody can get access to the data or use any of the credentials that may have that they may have gotten and try to get into your network and um, get access to the data. Installing antivirus, anti-malware software is an important consideration. Uh, along with that is you also want to make sure that you're running scans on an automated schedule and updating that software so that you're taking advantage of the, the most current repository of vulnerabilities and you can scan and detect those and remediate those quickly. Uh, the next thing is on your email systems, you can set up rules that say if I don't trust this domain or there's databases that tell you these domains are not trustworthy so you can block them before they hit your associates or uh, employees. So that eliminates the need for them to have to figure out whether it's a legitimate request or not. Similarly, web security policies, you can enforce rules on your uh, web browsers and environments that dictate which websites are trustworthy or not. You can have rules that say if an employee is trying to get to this website, I'm going to block it or deny access. And that prevents uh, you know, the potential for getting malware and things like that installed. Similarly, the other big things to consider are if a mobile device is an uh, important part of your day-to-day -day function, consider a mobile device management solution which helps create some sort of a container that isolates the company data from the employee's personal data. So that way you're not having uh, data go out uh, into their personal email and then they can carry it with them uh, if they leave the company. Similarly, along the same lines, data loss prevention tools to identify if any data is leaking or being exfiltrated. Uh, so you can set up thresholds that identify 
or and alert you on you know whatever threshold you said it could be 10 records it could be 100 records but it's just something for you to keep an eye on and lastly implementing encryption on your endpoints is important so if those devices go missing and your password protected them then that data is not accessible easily because it's encrypted and you know they won't have the decryption key next slide network security so one of the biggest uh, control that you can implement is having uh, controls on you know implementing firewalls to control who has access to your environment and network and who doesn't and knowing who is on your network already as well as who's trying to get in on your network is important so you can set up rules that say hey i don't have a need for anybody outside the us trying to connect to my website or my server or my network then you can enforce that using your rules in the firewalls so that's just one way to prevent unnecessary uh, uh, access to your networks the next one is a big one virtual private network so if you have uh, resources that need to connect to your network remotely implementing virtual private network is important because that encrypts the traffic as it's hitting your uh, network and environment and prevents any external user from accessing the uh, corporate data i think catherine mentioned remote desktop access earlier in the presentation that's important because it can create a gateway for people to get into your network if that rdp access is open so if you don't have a need for anybody to be remotely logging into, into your servers or uh, your laptops, disabling is uh, the best option. If you have explicit need for somebody to support uh, uh, or remotely support your uh, servers or infrastructure, limiting those users uh, who have access to or a way to mitigate that threat. For your, uh, for your wireless network, Enforce passwords. Don't uh, have wireless networks that are open that require passwords. Change uh, changing default router passwords is important because if uh, there's a lot of information available online for the manufacturer of a particular router and what the default settings and passwords and credentials are, so it's pretty easy for people to run automated scans and see if you know they can get into the router and it's important to do that uh, up front right when you're setting that up as usual updating your software and firmware to keep it current because these manufacturers do push out um, patches to remediate software and firmware vulnerabilities so you want to get uh, all of the fixes you can get web security and protecting your web presence is important because that directly impacts your brand reputation so anytime you have a web presence, you want to make sure that you're running uh, software scans and uh, remediating any vulnerabilities that are found uh, so that you are in control of what uh, your brand reputation is being presented to the world. Next slide. Identity and access management. Um, there are some key considerations in that space. The biggest one is uh, implementing least privilege policy. What that means is you only need to give uh, associates access to the data or infrastructure that they need to do their job. And the best way to do that is using role-based access. So if you have a number of people who are doing the same uh, job function, creating a role and adding those resources into that role makes it easier for you to manage. If one of those associates leaves the organization, you can just remove that individual from that role and they will not have access. So instead of managing access uh, individually and that typically creates a lot of overhead for the you know, ongoing administration, it's easier and more, uh, it's a best practice to do it on a role-based uh, basis. Using unique passwords and having a level of complexity that makes it difficult for somebody to guess or using automated uh, uh, tools that can crack those passwords is important. 
definitely one thing you want to consider is your password history and things like that so that you're not repeating the passwords and at the same time you're not reusing passwords i would say if you are thinking about it password managers are a, a good tool they can generate random passwords complex passwords and allow you to store those uh, safely there's a lot of information available online you can look it up and make choices based on what uh, you are comfortable with multi factor authentication i mean it's about uh, what you know what you have and who you are so definitely uh, for high value high risk transactions or high value high risk access uh, i would recommend that you implement multi factor authentication to add a, an additional level of control to manage uh, against users who have potentially gained credentials from previous breaches somewhere and they're trying to use the same credentials on your environment or network and conducting regular access reviews just to make sure that everybody who has the current access is still requiring that access or if somebody is no longer part of that organization you want to this is a an additional check to make sure that you're taking away that access and as i mentioned you know having a cadence that says as soon as the employee leaves the organization access is terminated within 24 hours or 8 hours whatever the case may be is important to remove orphan access into your environment next slide email security i think uh, we've talked about this in the business email compromise but this is again uh, important because a lot of the bad actors are using email and phishing to prompt employees to click on a link take them to a site enter credentials and harvest credentials from in that manner so some of the things to validate and confirm are if you are getting a lot of email that says urgent action required or something like that make sure it's from a legitimate uh, or a known vendor or known uh, sender of that email look closely at the url that's included in the email look at the sender uh, information if you are not sure uh, don't be in a hurry to click on attachments or embedded hyperlinks do not reply to spam uh, you are just validating that it's a legitimate uh, address for them to uh, hit you so taking those things into consideration is important there's a lot of tooling out there so email security applications can implement a lot of those checks for you there's a lot of things available that uh, again can look against and compare against known bad domains and things like that so if that email is coming from a known bad domain it can be blocked even before it hits the uh, the recipient and again just emphasizing that company email should not be used for personal email and communication it's just best to separate email for business purposes and personal purposes next slide scanning and patching a lot of the vulnerabilities that we are seeing today are, are you know out there and there's a a large number of information available about existing vulnerabilities so it's important that you have a good handle on an inventory of all of the pieces of infrastructure and assets that you have and you're scanning them regularly so Uh, it allows you to prioritize the vulnerabilities that have been identified there's a resource i've identified that tells you what's the criticality of that vulnerability is there an active exposure active um, threats out there so you can prioritize based on available funding and resources which ones are most critical to uh, to remediate and as always uh, you know you want to test the patching before you deploy it and have a backup plan the last thing you want is you're trying to de deploy a patch and it does not have any you know it it's not compatible with the systems you're using or there's a dependency that you didn't identify earlier and things don't work out as well so always have a backup plan uh, otherwise you may have uh, impact to your business as a result of that next slide so talking about backing up and backing out um so it's important to have a backup and recovery plan uh, and 
to do that, it's important to understand what are your critical assets and what are your critical dependencies. So if you're dependent on a, a vendor for your business workflow, you want to make sure that that vendor can support your requirements. So if you're expecting your website or whatever to come up in eight hours or you know two hours, you want to make sure that everything that is required to make that happen has the same level of resiliency built in. So you want to make sure that as you're creating your backup and uh, disaster planning, that plan is stored in a place that you can get to in the event of an actual disaster. Too often, uh, businesses can do a good job of you know, creating a plan, but they store it in the same servers and locations that uh, may not be accessible. So keep an offline copy, keep it at a different location, and keep plans updated as you know, your business grows and evolves and you want to make sure that if you've added a new location or a new site, that's reflected in your business plans. Uh, and what I mentioned here about recovery time objective and point objective is how much data can you afford to lose and how much time can you be uh, down? So that dictates how frequently you want your backups done. And, uh, you know, keep that, keep a copy in the cloud, keep it in a different location that you can get to. And periodically test those processes to make sure that they're working. All of the technologies change so frequently, you want to make sure that what you have backed up and the technologies you're using for recovery, they're working as you expect them to. Next slide. Okay, there's a poll for you. Uh, do you have an incident response plan in the event of a cyber attack? Yes, no, don't know. What is an incident response plan? So Catherine, I'm not seeing responses to the survey question, so you may have to read it out once you get the survey responses. Everyone, please vote on your screen now. <laughs> We still have a few votes coming in. Brianna, did no one else see the answers to the responses earlier? I can see them. I think it depends on the view on their screen right now. Okay. I'll tell you just um, a bit, sorry. Okay. There we go. Yes, 40%, no, 40%, 13%, what is an incident response plan? <laughs> <laughs> so like an opportunity for improvement in this space and if you go to the next page i think uh, hopefully these stats uh, and the benefits of having an incident response plan spur you to create one there's also a resource that's highlighted here that should make it easy for you to craft one for your business basically study uh, statistics have shown that having an incident response plan reduces the cost of an incident by about 35 percent that's a big deal it helps you identify that you have an incident it helps you to identify and minimize the damage and you know the scope of that incident if you're able to quickly uh, figure out you know what you need to do and it also hopefully it helps you identify patterns that can prevent future attacks uh, that follow the same kind of uh, an approach or threat uh, vector. And it also helps you, uh, you know, with your compliance and regulatory requirements, if there's notifications that need to occur, then you can do those quicker and, you know, save you some fines and things like that. So it's important to have that uh, plan in place sooner rather than later. Next slide. So we have talked, out, talked about a lot of controls you can implement, uh, some ideas for you to consider. And I know it can be overwhelming, but um, there's a lot of um, companies and providers who can do this all, you know, it's security as a service or managed security services. So these companies can help deploy out of the box security solutions for you, which can allow you to meet all of your security needs quickly. Uh, a lot of these have a model that is subscription based so you don't have a lot of upfront capital investment and at the same time you know you have you can focus on the core business functions and what you know and you know have somebody else focus on and meet everything that you need to get done from a security perspective however there are some things that you need to consider when you are selecting that security provider one is 
Are you looking at them to provide end-to-end -end security solutions or fill in some gaps uh, in terms of your capabilities? So having uh, those things considered is important. Uh, knowing where that data is stored and you know what are the restrictions. If you're not expecting that data to be stored offshore, maybe you need to consider that upfront um, so that you know that is part of your assessment of that vendor that you're considering. You want to look at uh, the the support model and the roles and responsibilities. What is their service level agreement? How how soon do you expect them to reach out to you and let you know of you know any incidents that may be occurring or that may need research? As well as um, you want to understand, do they meet your compliance and audit needs? So if you're in scope for you know, PCI, which is payment card industry or HIPAA from a health insurance perspective. Uh, are those vendors um, certified to be working in that space? So because at the end of the day, you're still on the hook for meeting the compliance needs. So you can't outsource the accountability for that. You want to make sure that, you know, they have the same data response, data privacy and, uh, you know, security infrastructure in place that you expect. So as part of the assessment, you can look at some uh, you know, third party auditors and assessors who may have assessed those vendors and they should be able to provide copies. Typically it's a SOC 1, SOC 2 or a PCI certification. And lastly, if you are no longer gonna conduct business with them or you're moving to a different provider, you wanna understand what are the uh, you know, data destruction, or you know, do you want them to return the data? That's something that you want to think through upfront before you get into a relationship with that vendor. And I think the next slide is a poll on cyber insurance because that is one one way of minim either minimizing or augmenting your cyber risk posture. So let's get the results of that. And Catherine, you're going to take us through the next slide, right? <laughs> Thanks. Please vote on your screen. A few more votes coming in. I'll give it a few more seconds. Okay. All right. So for those of you that, that don't see the poll results, we have uh, about 30, 40, um, 50% with no insurance, 40% that don't know, and the remainder that uh, have an endorsement and plan on renewing it. So, okay. So we're coming to a close here. We are our last few slides, but I don't think um, we can have this conversation without at least having a discussion about cyber risk insurance. Um, it's really a part of the risk management plan and not in place of any of those steps or tips that Abe has offered. It's really going to help you uh, manage and mitigate once there's a loss, but it's not going to help you necessarily prevent, although uh, I'll get to that in a moment. So why I think cyber insurance is so important for small businesses is that generally speaking, while the policies do vary widely and you have to probably uh, go to your agent as a source of information to help make sure that you get a policy that meets your needs. At the end of the day, the, the, the core coverages of that policy are data breach, responding to a data breach, ransomware, um, business interruption. They don't all have business email compromise. And when they do, it is usually limited, but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't try to get it onto your cyber policy and they'll cover any third party liability suits that arise out of a cyber attack that or a cyber event that you experience. And the reason it reduces the overall cost of an attack or the benefits of insurance is that as soon as you have an attack, you really just have a team of experts who've done this uh, right at your fingertips. You make the call and there are experts at negotiating with uh, ransomware attackers. There are, they have access to Bitcoin, they have vendors, on call who have access to Bitcoin if you choose to pay the ransomware and they know all the laws across the country um, for and, and federal and state on how to notify in case of a data breach. 
The last thing I want to point out is that often the insurance industry in this case has been really proactive in providing risk management solutions to their policyholders. So you'll see in almost all cases that once you become a policyholder, you will have, for example, access to incident response plan guidelines, how to build one out, um, and other maybe some basic phishing um, tools, maybe some basic educational tools. So definitely worth a, a consideration, definitely worth considering cyber risk insurance. So I'm just gonna wrap this up really quickly. The key takeaways are, you know, really no organization is immune from a cyber attack, which I think that you all answered that you understood that small businesses are susceptible. So I think that point, uh, you, you guys have that point. But you need to understand your exposure because if you don't understand how you are exposed, then how are you going to figure out how, to, how you want to protect your business and its continuity? Uh, employee training and awareness. I put half the battle, but it's really more than half the battle. Almost everything uh, stems from how your employees are aware and whether they will click on the link or go to an infected site or reuse a password or have a weak password. So that I think that you cannot overstate the importance of employee training and awareness. Uh, the other thing is, you know, Abe had a lot of tips that he proposed and um, you will have access, I think, to this PowerPoint so you can go in and take another look at these tips, but every additional measure that, that a company takes to protect themselves does add up. And not every process is complicated or expensive. A lot of these things you can uh, buy off the shelf. Um, the other thing, of course, having an incident response plan you know, now that we're in the pandemic, it's it sort of highlights a need to be prepared for the worst so that you can respond to it much more quickly and much more effectively at much lower cost and impact to your business. Always talk to your agent about cyber risk exposure, see if they can uh, help you and always consider insurance. It, it's maybe a lot cheaper than you think it is. And lastly, um, it's a very dynamic exposure. It changes all the time. Staying informed is important. We do have a business solution center at Nationwide where we do put information. We uh, listed the uh, website for you to access. Um, and with that, we're gonna go to question and answers, but I'm going to slip just to let you know that we also have included all of our sources in the PowerPoint presentation if anyone is interesting and interested in looking it up. Thank you, Catherine and Abhay. We have quite a few questions coming in through the chat and the Q&A. Please type in your questions now if you haven't. Uh, the first one I see from Miriam Torres, what is the single most important thing I can do to protect my business from a cyber attack? If you had to pick just one. Uh, right, well, <laughs> I, I, Abhay, you know what? We'll get to opinions. <laughs> would go with um, it's either going to involve email like technology to help you screen out some of the worst email and then uh, employee training but yeah I'm not really sure which one I pick <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think there's not a single most important thing but if you can do two or three things that are pretty easy for you know employee training and awareness is a big deal uh, and then you know, just patching and uh, sc scanning and patching. I think those are two biggest things, but a lot of the things we talked about are the technical controls, but on a day-to-day -day basis, just remembering you know, having good password hygiene, not reusing passwords, not clicking on stuff that you are not sure of and things like that, that goes a long way because those are the primary threat vectors that are being used to get access into your environment. James Duran has some really good questions, several of them. How safe is Dropbox or other file storage and sharing? So it's a fairly safe tool. At the end of the day, it's all about how you configure it, right? You have to make sure that you're setting up the right uh, permissions on the folders. You want to make sure that um, if you're using it to send a link to somebody, then the, the duration for which you're keeping that link active and then remove that link or expiring that link. Similarly, if you're trying to share the same file, you know, or with different vendors and they don't need to, uh, you know, get into that uh, location after they've 
picked up that uh, file or document you can give access for a limited duration and then take it away or you know you can just make sure that you're keeping the content that's applicable uh, for that duration of you know who you're sharing it with and if you're sharing it with somebody for a long time then just make sure that the permissions are appropriate and access is being managed another question from james does antivirus software protect you from hacks so anti uh, antivirus software is primarily going to identify against known vulnerabilities and is going to help you fix those so in a way yeah it does help you but there could be other things that you know at the end of the day if your password has been uh, made available somewhere uh, then a antivirus is not going to help you in that case right so there's some threats that it works against but there's other threats that are still out there that can cause an incident Thank you. A question from Rick Sanchez, I think for Catherine. Does going through an MSP lower my premiums if I purchase cyber insurance? Um, that is a good question. It probably depends on the size of the organization. Uh, there is, it, it, there are a lot of factors that go into underwriting an account. The use of a, of a managed service provider probably boosts uh, an account, but depending on the size of the company, there are also minimum premiums that we can accept and depending on the limit. So I would say that the better, the better the company is defended, the better it has, the better story it has for its cybersecurity posture, generally speaking, the better are the odds that it's gonna have a reduced premium. Sorry, it's not a very direct answer, but you know, <laughs> it's, insurance takes in a, into account a lot of different factors. And it's hard right now. You know, this is also, you know, it's a product that hasn't been around for a number of years, like property and GL and all these other uh, lines of business that everyone is much more familiar with. So we we are still sorting through on how to differentiate our customers and the quality of our customers. We know a good one from a bad one, but how do we determine, you know, within the pool of good that range? And so yes. I, I think in general, uh, the better that they come out ranked in, in cybersecurity assessments, the better their premium will look. Thank you. If I'm the victim of a cyber attack, what's the first step I should take? Do you want, uh, you want me to answer that, Abe? Sure, you can start and I can add to that. <laughs> well, if you're fortunate enough to have an insurance policy, it's probably directly to your ins insurance company because they have they, um, they have everything set and ready to go to respond to a cyber attack. Okay, there are, are, there are uh, a number of different um, types of attacks. What you wanna do is, even if you do a very basic incident response plan or you have an idea what to do, you definitely wanna have the, the phone numbers of at least sort of breach coaches, people that can help uh, or people that have um, expertise in handling a particular type of breach. It's usually a lawyer, so you would call a lawyer and then they have access to counsel. Or, I'm sorry, they have access, as counsel, they have access to forensics firms and they know, they understand the notification laws. They might have access to specific vendors that manage um, and negotiate on behalf of the, of the client for ransomware. You know, you can negotiate ransomware demands. I mean, we've seen ransomware demands, they ask for a million dollars and then, you know, the people who negotiate with them are experts, know them well and actually get it down to $100,000. So um, try, I would look for, I would try to find uh, breach coaches and counsel that can be that number that you call, even if you, so that if you don't have insurance, you have somewhere to go and then they have access to all the experts you need, depending on the type of cyber attack that you suffered. Yeah, and from a technical perspective, you want to make sure that you have identified how that uh, attack happened and you have, you know, closed those um, loops in terms of, uh, you know, first thing is you want to make sure that you have actually minimized or uh, closed out that attack in the sense, 
you know prevent them from getting access to more of your environment or a larger footprint and then you want to make sure that you know as Catherine mentioned you are reaching out to all of the resources so if you're supporting your infrastructure and things like that you have to take steps to uh, get your systems back up uh, after you validated but at the same time if you want to do forensics you want to make sure that you know that environment is isolated and people can actually get the the logs and things like that from those environments you don't want to be overwriting those and that could jeopardize your ability to collect information that could help you uh, do the necessary analysis so if you go to the incident response uh, planning site it does actually walk you through the different phases and the different uh, steps that you need to take to you know walk through that whole process so that's a good resource to uh, read up on well, thank you. With that, I know we are right at time. So I just want to uh, once again thank Ape and Catherine and the nationwide team for everything that you've shared with us and allow you to make any closing remarks that we might have missed. Oh, uh, Brianna, thank you for having us. It was a pleasure. Uh, we hope that you know, all the viewers got some something that they can take back with them, something that uh, is helpful. And if if, they, if anyone on the line has any ideas for any future sessions or anything that you think that we should dig in a little bit deeper, we definitely provided a lot of information and it was very high level. Uh, we hope that you followed most of it, but uh, we're willing to you know, dig deeper or try something different to, to help get the message, of, the, the message of cybersecurity out there. Again, thank you for having us and uh... There's a lot of resources that we have put together as well, as well as available on Google. So uh, look those up. Uh, there's templates and you know frameworks that you can download and start looking at and see which one is applicable to you and that you can use to get started on these things. So thanks, thanks. for having us. Thanks again, Pei and Catherine. Everyone, we will be sharing with you these slides as well as the recording. Please keep in touch with us. And with that, it concludes today's webinar. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.